save that story for last. Yes. Um, our deep dive today is all about tax evasion <laughs> and why you should do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is, a, this is a, a five-step plan on how to evade your taxes. <laughs> no. um, quite the opposite. We're going to be talking about what governments could do to stop BS millionaire tax cheats. Yes, to raise tax revenue at a time when really we need it almost unlike any other, right? With the deficits that we've created through COVID yeah. and with the stimulus that governments across the world has had to funnel into economies and the fiscal packages they had to pass yeah. in order to keep us all afro afloat, we need a better way to raise revenue. And the challenges that we now face with specifically the fight against climate change, yeah. right? And that's something that this report... so. When we first started this podcast, in probably our first like five to ten episodes, yeah. we read a book by someone named Joseph Stiglitz, who used to be, I think it was Secretary of the Treasury yeah. to Obama, um, or to maybe to Clinton. I don't know. I think it was. Uh, I think it was Obama. Okay, and it caught this report caught Anthony's eye because this man, Joseph Stiglitz, he wrote the foreword to the report it's crazy to me like it's so funny that that all came together yeah like, randomly ben had that book on his coffee table and he's like hey you want to start this podcast where we read this book and talk about it and now here we are <laughs> yeah. half a year later yeah and i found uber this famous. random report of that author <laughs> yeah uber famous yeah. yeah um and it it's the this report is the first of its kind it's mm -hmm. called the it's the 2024 global tax evasion report it's out of the eu actually um what is the eu agency if i scroll to the top here the EU Tax Observatory put this together, um, and it's coordinated by a bunch of the leading tax evasion experts. Um, Stiglitz wrote the foreword. It's really cool because as you read it, it's so many of these ideas connect back to the things that he laid out in the book that we read. Um, it kind of feels like these people who are putting together this report and the people that have done this research have like they feel like they're following in his footsteps and continuing yeah. his work. So that's, that's really super cool. true. That's super true. Yeah. Okay. So first I want to do the big picture. What does tax evasion look like? There's a bunch of different ways it's done. Um, and what is the state of it now? So for a long time, so there are a bunch of different ways taxes are evaded. One of them is offshore wealth. That's one of the biggest ones. Um, from, about up until 2017, it was estimated that up to 90 or 95 percent of offshore financial wealth went unreported and thus untaxed. Unbelievable. Right? Yeah. Um, and this, fortunately, has actually changed because since 2017 and 2018, there have been big advances in how this wealth is reported. There's now automatic sending of financial information about accounts managed by financial institutions um, of a country where some offshore wealth is held to the country of the holder's residence. Mm -hmm. So that has made this form of evasion much less common today. We're going to get much more into that. Um, but this comes under these two major paradigm shifts that happened in the 2010s. The first one was proudly enough led by the U.S., it was called the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Yes. Now, this was spawned out of the Great Recession, right? Mm. This is in, this was when we're passing Dot Frank, that piece of legislation. We're regulating our banks again as much as we did. We should have done more, but it is what it is. We 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 passed the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, and this federal law um, requires all non-U.S. foreign financial institutions to search their records for customers with um, indicates that they might have a connection to the United States. Mm -hmm. Now. Estimates at the time said that it would produce $8.7 billion in tax revenue over 11 years. Later estimates revised that number down to $3 billion, but it's all very, very up in the air, and it's hard to measure how much money that it would actually take in. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that since the enactment of um, fact, fact, FATCA, the IRS has received approximately $8 billion from the F the FBAR penalties. Now, the FBAR penalties are penalties on banks for not reporting the person who they indicate might be tied to the United States. Mm -hmm. So they're not capturing, it looks like they're not capturing the revenue from the people directly. They're capturing the money from the banks who shouldn't be holding the people's money to begin with. Yeah. The, That's what's happening. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. This has proved to be a large cost for foreign businesses and banks. There's no doubt about that. 
there has been a boon to consulting and business services companies since its passing, mm-hmm. because now these banks need people to scroll through their records and find people who have ties to the United States. Mm-hmm. So they need more consulting agencies to do that, that they don't have the time to do in their in-house. Now, Republicans have proposed to reject this bill in 2017, repeal it completely. Um, some Democrats... Uh, which this is really funny. Democrats who live abroad apparently has its own coalition. It's like its own voting bloc and they have their own organization and they came out against it, which is just so messed up. Yeah. It's like Democrats abroad for tax cheats. And it's like, because you're the ones cheating on your taxes. Yeah. It's nuts. Um, U.S. investors um, with hidden offshore assets moved assets to other countries that have provided secrecy and has enabled these investors to continue to evade U.S. tax liabilities. So, What's happening here is there's been a little bit more of a crackdown specifically since 2014 because that is when the Swiss government signed on to assist the United States with FATCA. Mm. So 2014 is a switch moment where now the Swiss banks are now working with the United States as well. So what we've seen is that approximately $300 million a year is being generated from the, the FATCA taxes. Now, with $300 million a year for the FATCA taxes, that comes in under the $700 million that was expected. But if you include the FBAR penalties, now you're above the estimation of the money we expected to bring in. Okay. Yeah, so that's what went on with FAT- FATCA. And that started this move of bringing in that offshore money. Yes, yes. Um, finally, so a country had started to hold other countries accountable for the offshore holdings of their residents. And the U.S. started that. And then the EU followed suit with what is called the Common Reporting Standard, the CRS of the OECD. And the the CRS went a step further because FATCA was focused on income streams that U.S. citizens accumulated offshore. But the CRS not only included income streams, but also wealth. So it looked at the sizes of bank accounts and of security holdings, stuff like that. Um, This mismatch causes a little bit of a problem now. And one of the suggestions of the report is that the U.S. should get onto the CRS because the U.S. still says we have FATCA, so we're good enough. I'm going to get into that later. Mm -hmm. But some evidence of how big of an issue this was before 2017, 2010, before any of this came into play There was very, very little offshore wealth reported even at all before these systems were in place. Less than $1 trillion, which sounds like a lot, um, but when you compare it to the $12.6 trillion that was reported in offshore wealth in 2022, that's almost nothing. Absolutely nothing. So we've made big strides, but this issue hasn't disappeared Um, Some offshore financial institutions don't comply with CRS because they face no real threat from foreign authorities. Um, And so what you can think about here is a a Swiss bank doesn't necessarily, even though they are required by law to report the holdings of Americans to the U.S., their U.S. tax collectors or tax authorities aren't really going to come and punish these Swiss banks in any way. They can't do much in that vein. So even though because the system is in place, there is more automatic communication happening because these banks don't want to necessarily be openly defying international law, they still can do it without significant enforcement. Right, and those FBAR penalties now become a cost-benefit analysis for these banks where the banks decide, okay, you know what, it actually costs me more money to get all these guys send their information over to the U.S. so they can get taxed, I'll actually save money by avoiding all that work and just paying the penalty. Exactly. Yeah. So there's more work to do there. We will get into that more later on as well. But I want to get into, um, or I guess this will, yeah, I'll get into this a little bit more now. I I took these notes fairly rapidly over the past few days, so it might be a little all over the place and hold me accountable. Okay. Um, So... A large body of research has shown that without the kind of automatic reporting that was encouraged by FATCA, that was mandated by the CRS from the EU, 
um, that there is widespread tax evasion. Um, and I was really curious how this trend started. It started in Switzerland with the rise of Nazi Germany because Classic. as these right wing, these far right movements were starting to take hold in in Germany and they were like in Italy and in other countries, right? They were still happening. You didn't know whether they were going to win or not. One of the things that Nazi Germany did very early on was freeze the accounts of the Jewish citizens wow. there. So these people who had families that had built up enormous amounts of wealth uh, needed somewhere safe to hide it that they knew it, where they knew it wouldn't be reported to the Nazis. And Switzerland was like, we got you. We'll hold on to that. Wow. Okay. Um, that's a really nice start to something that becomes so evil. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, I feel like that's the case a lot of the time. Yeah, right. Yeah. So this report has a methodology that estimates that $12 trillion of wealth, which is equivalent to 12% of global GDP, was held offshore by households at the end of 2022. That is so much assets that are not being appropriately taxed or appropriately monitored. Yeah. Maybe a lot of them are appropriately taxed, but it's not appropriately monitored. And we don't. it's hard for us to even measure if they are getting taxed correctly at that point. Yeah, it is. Interestingly, though, the increased transparency of these automatic bank information sending or the, these transfers doesn't seem to have affected the amount of wealth held offshore as a percentage of GDP, mm -hmm. meaning tax evasion probably isn't the main reason for offshore holding, even though we know it is a mechanism for those ends when people want it to be. Right. Um, like it, it offshore holding is makes it makes it easier to cheat off your taxes. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that people always have offshore wealth to cheat on their taxes. Yes. It's just like a very nice, it seems to be a very, very nice byproduct of that arrangement. But because of the way they're operating their businesses, they still need those offshore assets. Yes. There's also other, there's also other types of assets that people can hold offshore. And I'll get into this later, like real estate that aren't tracked by these systems, right? These are only there's, they're really focused on just financial wealth with FATCA and with CRS. Mm -hmm. So they have these other ways to evade. Um, over the past 20 years, a lot of this, interestingly, has shifted away from places like European offshore centers in Switzerland and towards Asian offshore centers like Hong Kong and Singapore, which was interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, Switzerland goes on a massive decline of their share of financial services and offshore holdings from 2005. And the real reason for this that I found was wealth creation is just happening faster in the East. Mm. Um, and money that is created in the East tends to stay in the East. If uh, people become rich in China, they tend to keep their money in China. And that's yeah. what seems to be happening. And it seems that the Asian bloc is now where most GDP is happening, GDP growth is happening, where most wealth, where most wealth creation is happening, and it seems to be where most offshore wealth is getting stored. So Boston Consulting Group forecasts that the wealth of the richest people in the world will swell from $460 trillion um, to $600 trillion by 2027. And this rate of new wealth is specifically coming from Asia and the Middle East. Um, very much will overtake the West in the coming couple years, four years. Mm. Completely overlap the West. Yeah. Um, in Singapore, the, the number of single-family offices that provide wealth management has jumped nearly threefold since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and this is being driven by an influx of wealthy Chinese families. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, in addition to this, uh, Sweden has also faced some troubles with the collapse of Credit Suisse, mm -hmm. a very big um, Swiss bank. With that going down, Russian sanctions actually hurt Switzerland in regards to this. Um, so that's why Switzerland has kind of lost a lot of its market share in the financial industry. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and s offshore wealth, part of why it's so important. So as progressives, as liberals, we are interested in progressive taxation rather than regressive taxation, right? Which means we think that the rich should pay a higher percentage on their taxes than poor people because they're more able to. And so offshore wealth is really important for this particular point because evidence shows that the individuals who hold offshore wealth are heavily concentrated at the top of the wealth income distribution. Um, they think that about half of offshore wealth was held 
by the top 0.01% in 2022. What a shocker, <laughs> right? I mean, how many people do you know that have offshore wealth? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that is just crazy. Like half, 50% of it by one one hundredth of 1%. <laughs> that's crazy to god me. that's and that's so much money that is just not getting taxed appropriately which is such a shame because it yes. makes your taxes higher yes it makes your taxes higher when we can't capture their taxes yeah absolutely and it drives us further into a deficit and it's it's brutal it's um, just bad so i talked we talked about the automatic exchange of information i want to talk about where the gap still lies before the estimate was that that 90 to 95 percent of offshore wealth was going untaxed mm-hmm Still, we estimate that 27%, maybe a little bit more than 27%, is going untaxed. Um, Why this is, is a few reasons. One is the idea of non-compliance by banks. So there was a a case of Credit Suisse misreporting U.S. citizenship of account holders or wiring undeclared funds to other banks of their their U.S. citizen account holders without notifying the Department of Justice which it was required to do after it was sued by DOJ in 2007 for helping citizens evade taxes. Wow. Um, so these companies, these banks can misreport the the owners to help them avoid that. Foreign People can use shell banks, and this one's really interested to me. Foreign financial institutions don't have to report on their accounts that are held by other financial institutions. So like one person, one billionaire can start a shell company, a shell bank and hold money in that shell bank to evade taxes because now the wealth, the offshore wealth in that shell bank doesn't have to be reported. Or the offshore bank that that shell bank holds in another bank doesn't have to be reported. Got it. Yeah. Um, Wow. Which is so complex. God, what a... Bitch, that does that. <laughs> I know. The length that these people go, I just spat everywhere. Um, <laughs> I wish it was on his face. I wish it was Bezos' face. Yeah. Uh, one other thing, crazy thing that I never would have known about. There are these things called citizen by investment programs, which basically means you pay a certain amount and you're automatically a citizen oh, of the yeah, country. Sure. Yeah. Like the Cayman Islands has a program like this, right? Seychelles has a program like this. The British Virgin Islands. All of these tax havens, these obvious tax havens, have these citizen by investment programs. So they the country that they that are offering the citizens the citizenship can opt not to receive information from other countries. Mm-hmm. And then it's never known like how much offshore wealth these people have or isn't traveling through the like the CRS channels. Unbelievable. Right? It's <clears throat> wild. It's wild. There's also People can get around it because of different reporting thresholds where accounts under $250,000 aren't required to be reported. And sometimes ownership stakes under 25% aren't required to be reported. So you can just have eight of your family members as owners of millions of dollars in offshore wealth. Mm -hmm. And since you split it between all of them, it doesn't have to be reported. That sounds like a succession plot. Yeah. Right? Totally. (laughs) Totally. No, it's it's crazy to me because these are the types of... uh, avenues that billionaires go through to avoid paying taxes and it's it's insane to me because now billionaires have an effects of effective tax rate of around zero to 0.5 percent of their wealth yeah that's what their effective tax rate is mm-hmm. and it's because of the frequent using of these shell companies that you're talking about that totally. they're able to avoid so much of their taxes so think about that zero to 0.5 percent of their wealth they pay in taxes if you're watching this you pay more of a percent than that Guaranteed 100%. Yeah. Is it fair that a billionaire pays less of a percentage of taxes than you? Is that right? Is that just? Is that good for our economy? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. God, Oh, it's no. terrible for the economy. God, it's so bad. Yeah. So you should be angry about this. And this isn't about big government, small government. It's about good government here. Mm-hmm. And this is just about enforcing the laws that we have on the books. And in addition, making sure that we have a just economic distribution of resources that reflect who does the necessary work in this country yes exactly it's it's not even a matter of 
like cracking down or reducing freedoms. It's just getting rid of loopholes. Right. Right. That's kind of what this whole report is about. Yes. Yeah. How do we get rid of all these loopholes so the system actually works as it is intended to work? As you voted for the lawmakers to go and write the laws to make it work like that. Yeah. These billionaires say, I don't really give a shit about the laws that the U.S. citizens made. I'm going to not give them the money that they rightfully deserve. Yeah. And you should be angry at that. Mm, definitely. Okay. So I, I want to go a little bit deeper into the importance of offshore real estate. Um, which again, this is important because there has been significant wealth shifted into real estate since the advent of FATCA and the CRS mm -hmm. because they only cover financial assets, right? Like your stock portfolios, your bank accounts. But offshore real estate ownership is large. The extent is unclear because of the commonality of indirect ownership through companies or trusts. But in six cities where there is data, 10%, $500 billion of the total real estate there is owned by foreigners. Okay. That is insane. Those people, I mean, they're owning this real estate. They don't live there. No. We are in a housing crisis. We are short of housing in this country. And 10% of the buildings in these major cities are owned by foreign investors. Yeah. They're treating our housing stock, our communities as speculation toys for their larger game of avoiding taxes. Yes, of course. With with pure incentives to just raise rents as high as they can of constantly. Course. They don't even live there. No, of course not. Um, yeah, so, so after CRS, there was evidence that showed that up to 25% of financial assets redirected from tax havens went to real estate to avoid it. And I think a really good example here is Dubai to right. show how easy it is to not report your real estate holdings offshore. There's good data and 27% of the market is foreign owned. Um, and one study focused specifically on Norwegian nationals found that only 66 out of 227 who had holdings in Dubai reported them, right? So that's, that's almost three quarters of these people who aren't paying taxes on the wealth that they hold in Dubai. It's a relatively small sample, but I have no reason to believe that those trends would differ at all in different situations. No, it's, it's insane. Um, I, 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 saw, I read in there that evidence from the United Kingdom documents a substantial offshore ownership that accounts that can, constitutes 1.25% of residential properties yeah. and increases to 15% when zooming in on the top end properties. So they're really just buying like the top end of these condos here mm -hmm. and then they're just keeping them empty, yeah. which is a larger problem with luxury housing generally. We have a massive problem like this in New York City where a lot of these apartments that overlook um, uh, <clears throat> Central Park are just sitting there empty. Yeah. And it's because that they're just invest investment tools. And so it's really nuts to see 1.2, I mean, 1.25% of your entire residential stock being owned by foreigners who don't live there. Just one country's foreigners. Yeah. Just one other country. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. But it's but it's so common, right? Because all of the, there, so much of this is just owned by the, the billionaires. Right. Um, I want to move on to profits and tax havens. Mm -hmm which kind of has a, a few sides, but how do companies, specifically multinational companies, which operate in many different countries, how do they reduce their taxes by recording profits in countries with lower tax rates? So there's a few ways. One is intra-group transfer price manipulation, which, oh my God, when I describe this, it feels scummy to me. <laughs> a subsidiary in a high tax country will buy from another subsidiary in a low tax country at an artificially high price. So let's say that Google has a subsidiary in France, which is a relatively high tax country, and it has another subsidiary in the Cayman Islands, which is a zero tax country. Mm -hmm. Basically, the, the French subsidiary will buy from the Cayman subsidiary. So all of the profit, all of the income is booked to the Caymans. Oh my God, dude. And so they'll set their companies up. It's so funny. I work at a multinational company and I started to wonder, does this happen <laughs> at my company? Um, so they, yes, they, they sell to the 
they they sell to the high tax countries they sell to the high tax the high tax country buys, buys from the low tax yes. yeah okay yeah that that's one way companies locate ip in low tax countries and charge subsidiaries in high tax countries wow. same type of thing um and the results of this are absolutely astounding to me if you look at this graph so i have it on this is what page 12 of our notes and it shows the excess profitability of foreign firms in tax havens. So <laughs> what this graph is showing is the the pre-tax corporate profits as a percentage of compensation of employees in of foreign firms versus local firms. In Puerto Rico, okay, which is separate for taxation purposes from the US, you see local firms with pre-tax corporate profits that are probably around 20% of the employee compensation. The foreign firms have that corporate profits at 1,400% of the compensation of employees. That's and so you, you have very similar looks from all of these other countries that are obvious tax havens. Ireland, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, Switzerland, Singapore. It's, it's so blatant. It, they're just laughing in our faces with this. Okay? There's, it's been estimated that 35% of foreign profits were shifted to tax havens, and that's equivalent to 6% of all global corporate profits. That's unbelievable. It's crazy. It's it's insane to me that, that there isn't a larger political movement ready to crack down on this. Yeah, which is why this it's, it's exciting that this report is out yes. because this seems like the thing that's pushing for it. Um, but the revenue loss from tax shifting equates to 10% of corporate the tax revenue lost, right? Yes. It's 10% of corporate profits globally. And that's a huge deal. Yes. It's hundreds of billions of dollars. Yes. So 10% of corporate tax revenues are lost because of this. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, the United States has done something to try to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, there, we passed inside of Donald Trump's Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Mm -hmm. There actually was a mechanism in there to go after corporate tax cheats and it seemed to have reduced the growth to around ten percent. That's what I've seen. Okay, right? I didn't know if it was if it was growing, or maybe there's just not even enough of a sample yet to know. Well, because I have I have the chart here. Yeah, I don't I'm have it on that. the notes. You see it? Okay. Yeah. So like, the percent of corporate tax revenue that gets collected, a percent of global corporate tax revenue getting collected, is at around ten percent. But this didn't. It wasn't. Wait. Oh, no, no, no. This is the global corporate tax of revenue lost. This is lost. So it, the percent of corporate tax revenue getting lost has been growing significantly since the 80s. Mm -hmm. So 1% of our corporate taxes were lost in 1980. Okay. Now, 10% of our corporate taxes are getting lost. <laughs> it's increased by a multitude of 10. Yeah. Now, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act arguably kept it at 10, mm. um, but... You know, that's where we're at now. Okay. Okay. I I thought I had read that, that the race to the bottom had just kind of continued. The race to um, the bottom has continued, but that does that necessarily mean that the percent No, not no, necessarily. Right? Yeah. Um Okay. No, I'll just I'll just take your word for this. Yeah. Yeah. Um so there have been policy things to happen. Tax Cuts and Jobs Act had one of them. There was also a tentative agreement on a global minimum corporate tax. <coughs> that would be great. Which was a huge deal. In October 2021, close to 140 countries and territories endorsed the principle of a global minimum tax of 15% of the profits of multinational companies. This is known as Pillar 2 of the OECD two-pillar solution to profit shifting. This is a landmark agreement. It's the first time there's an international agreement sending a floor to how low certain tax rates on profits can go. So this is like the best type of solution yeah. that we can have possible, right? People often argue against uh, like a one world government. Well, taxation is one place where having one policy across the world is the best case scenario because then no one has anywhere to go to evade taxes right right you just you have to pay the rate and if you don't then the irs or whatever country's version of the irs can come after you yeah um there are also provisions 
in this proposal that would allow countries to tax the difference for activities in non-participant countries, right? So it's like if I'm uh, an American headquartered company doing business in South Africa and South Africa has the tax rate of 7% only and it's below the 15% of the global minimum tax, the U.S. can tax the difference of the 8%. Um, but the agreement is partially on hold because of opposition in the U.S. And I'm not super well informed on why this is, but I think partly it's because it will hurt the amount of foreign wealth being invested in the U.S., mm. which has been an advantage for us recently. Um, if this does go through, if we do get a 15% global corporate minimum tax, we're looking at increasing corporate tax revenue by $220 billion in yeah. 2023. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's exactly what we need. If you couple that with a global billionaire's tax, 2% um, of a billionaire's wealth taxed every year, that would raise $250 billion in revenue. Yeah. If you combine both of those things to a five, that's around $500 billion, that is enough to build the infrastructure in low-income countries to protect them from the worst of climate change and get them to a green economy. Yes. That's all. That's that's what we're talking about. Exactly. Exactly. That's how much money we're talking about. This here. is why this is so important. So important. But the crazy thing is even, so this agreement, this pillar two agreement is weak. The 15% rate is a little low, and we're going to go into scenarios later on on the differences in tax revenue that would come from raising that rate. But the bigger thing is there are loopholes to get you out of this 15% minimum based on percentages of tangible assets and payroll. Mm. So the idea there is the problem is the financialization, is the gains. And if you're actually producing, if you're actually paying employees and producing tangible assets, then you're not part of the problem. So right. you should get exempt from the taxes. But the truth is what the research has shown is the problem is that we continue to have this race to the bottom and that it's not okay to say, okay, it's, it's better to be in this country and to do your manufacturing here. The problem is that overall lower taxation leads to less output, more unemployment, um, and is going to make a less progressive economy, Definitely. more inequality. Um, and right now, because of this U.S. holdup, there's also a pause on the backstop for non-participant countries, which is really frustrating. Um, the sum of these loopholes would mean that the tax revenue from the policy would be about cut in half, down to $110 billion. Mm -hmm. So... Now, the U.S. isn't alone in this. The The, the mm. U.S. Is also doesn't have their hands clean here. The U.S. Are, it has passed some legislation, notably the Inflation Reduction Act, which has subsidized a, a large amount of investment into green energy. Now, this investment is done through tax credits, some of it on the consumer side, which we love, mm -hmm. some of it on the corporate side, which isn't great, but I'm still glad it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, that's money that's going into the corporate sector is now finding that it will probably hurt overall egalitarian measures in the society and if we don't if we don't tie those tax those corporate tax credits to some type of egalitarian policy mm -hmm. designed to redistribute the profits of these corporations that will get the money and the profits from public tax incentives then we're going to start having a big problem Yes. So the, the good thing is that the IRA does have some provisions to mitigate, mitigate those unequalizing effects, including giving more to companies that pay higher wages. That's exactly the type of policy that mm -hmm. we need wrapped up in these credits. Um, but these tax credits are also relevant to the 15% minimum because they'll kind of greenwash that minimum out. The 15% corporate minimum excludes what are called unrefundable, non-refundable tax credits. But all of the tax credits in the IRA are considered refundable. So they can kind of completely take a company's tax liability down past that 15, down to 5% or less. Yeah. Um, this report estimates that green tax credits will amount to the equivalent of 15% of corporate tax revenue in the next decade, I'm personally expecting it to be higher than that because mm -hmm. I think because uptake of tax credits in the IRA is unlimited. So it's just based on how much companies want to, how much they do the activities. And it's already exceeding the 
the thought of how much they would do it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that is going to take away a big chunk of taxes that would be collected worldwide. Mm -hmm. So now I want to talk about more individuals, how they avoid taxes, who is avoiding taxes. And obviously it's the high net worth individuals. Um, not only are they the ones that are holding all the offshore wealth, but they have other tax evasion tactics that they tend to take. Um, interestingly, in most Western countries, you see relatively progressive taxation all the way up until you hit the billionaire class. And the drop-offs in, for example, France and the U.S. look particularly stark. It's insane. Um, so why do billionaires tend to have lower tax rates than other social groups? In France, the billionaires tend to be major shareholders of publicly listed dividend-paying companies. And so there is a tax that should be levied on those dividends, but they avoid income taxes from those dividends by owning shares indirectly, again, through a shell company. So instead, they pay the much lower corporate income tax on those dividends. Um, they can also take advantage of a parent subsidiary loophole, which was meant to avoid double taxation, but in reality can enable no taxation, where they... Um, where they can own the stocks through a subsidiary and then the income can go to the parent and it kind of basically confuses the tax system so it doesn't know who to tax and taxes no one instead. Companies in the U.S. take advantage of this system by retaining all their earnings instead of paying dividends mm. so shareholders don't get any income and instead just borrow against their large portfolios. And that's why stock buybacks are such a problem. Yes. Right? That's where the stock buyback thing is coming into play. Totally. Totally. So now the question is, what policies can we put into place to fix these issues? Um, first one falls into the category of building on the global corporate minimum tax. So we have this great idea that a bunch of countries have outwardly said we're on board with 15% global minimum tax. Well, the first one is let's remove these carve outs for tangible assets and payroll that we just talked about, right? It's estimated that this would increase tax revenue by 20 to 25% in the short term and 10% in the long term. If we're estimating that that was 220 billion, we're talking about $22 billion per year mm -hmm. from getting rid of these. The carve outs are based on this idea of financial gamesmanship being the problem that's not just the problem the problem is the different the race to the bottom in tax rates okay plus raising the rate from 15 percent would be a huge deal that would lead to an increase in revenue by a factor of raising the rate from 15 to 20 percent would lead to an increase in revenue by a factor of 1.75 increasing it from 15 to 25 percent triples the revenue increasing it to 30% nearly quadruples the revenue to almost a trillion dollars per year. Yeah, that's insane. It's wild. Now, it, now, this is great because we always talk about, okay, what's the downside of a corporate tax? Well, the downside of a corporate tax is that your, country, that your um, company isn't going to want to do business in your country. Well, if we make it a global one, they'll have nowhere to go. Exactly. Exactly. It has to be global. It has to be global. Really. And, the, and and not just for the corporations, but also for the very rich. Yes, absolutely. So that's the second idea here. Studies show the best way to identify the rich and tax them is wealth because assets and liabilities are clearly defined and they're manipulated a lot less easily than income. The very rich can often decide just how much income they want to be paid by their assets in a year. Very true. Right? So billionaires pay around 0.5% of their wealth in income tax right now, the proposal is a minimum 2% wealth tax on billionaires. So that would also generate about the $250 billion number that you said earlier. The difficulties would come in valuing private businesses held by billionaires, but there are ways to do that still. Where they're holding very large private businesses that could be compared to public visit businesses and valued based on those comparisons. Mm -hmm. There's another argument against this that is that the billionaire's wealth is too illiquid to pay the wealth tax, but the only way that their wealth becomes that illiquid is if billionaires purposely organize it that way so that they don't have to pay as much right. in taxes. So by the same logic, they can do the exact opposite to yeah. be able to pay the tax. And again, I, I always like to say this when we talk about wealth taxes like this, your your house is an illiquid asset, mm -hmm. but you still get taxed 
on your property taxes every year yeah. based off of that illiquid asset, why are the billionaires any different from you? Yeah, exactly. Why should their offshore real estate be treated differently? Yeah, insane. Yeah. If anything, it should obviously be taxed more because it's a much more extraneous, unnecessary asset for yes, them to hold. Yes, exactly. Um, what about people moving to places with lower taxes? So we're saying, obviously, the ideal scenario is everyone implements the minimum tax, but there are many countries that won't want to because they enjoy benefits by being tax havens. So in lieu of that, we have a few different options. One is we can tax high wealth people who have been in the country for many years, even after they leave, and credit any taxation in the destination country against that paid in the home country to prevent double taxation. So here's the idea, right? Someone spends 40 years in the U.S. building their business, and then they want to retire to somewhere like Seychelles, which has 0% tax rate. Um, they, Based on how long they've stayed in the U.S., they will be taxed by the U.S. a certain number of years. So if you've mm -hmm. stayed there 40 years, maybe you're still taxed for 10 years yeah. after you leave the U.S. Um, the reason this is effective is because people don't usually just start in a place like Seychelles and build massive amounts of wealth. They start in places like the U.S. or France or Great Britain, places with higher tax rates. Well, you know what it is? They use the intelligence of the Western countries. They use our institutions. They use our infrastructure. They use our people. And then the second they have to pay for the success that their country made possible to them, mm -hmm. they dip. Yeah. And they decide, you know what, I have no civic obligation to assist the society that birthed my entire enterprise, which is insane. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I, again, they're just exploiting the system, yeah, which I mean, is set up for them. Yeah. That's why we need to change that system. Mm -hmm. um, it should not apply to people who are not very rich. Again, we want progressive taxation here. Um, and it should be possible to enforce now because of automatic exchange of bank information so we can easily more easily see how much people have made in different countries and how much they're being taxed mm -hmm. so that they're not double taxed yeah besides that we would want to implement minimum taxes absent global agreements where a country with a higher minimum tax could also tax a proportion of the tax deficit of a multinational company so the example is, let's say there's a company that's headquartered in the U.S. that operates in South Africa. It earns a billion dollars of profit in South Africa, a billion dollars in the Caymans, and a billion dollars in the U.S. The minimum tax in South Africa is 25%. So the tax deficit is $0 in South Africa. It's $250 million in the Caymans because the tax rate is 0% in the Caymans. And let's say the tax rate is 10% in the U.S. So the tax deficit is 100 or $100 million in the U.S then there's an idea that South Africa can tax this deficit, which would be about $350 million, at some percentage, which might be determined by, say, the sales, the percentage of sales done in South Africa. Basically, mm. we need a mechanism that says if you are, um, if you do business in a high-tax country and also in a low-tax country, some of the business that you're doing in that low-tax country can still be taxed based on the business you're doing in that high tax country. And that's going to incentivize the low tax country to hike up their tax revenue yes. because that now what you're doing is you're making that company pay for higher taxes one way or another, mm -hmm. right? There's no benefit for them operating in that low tax country anymore yep. because they're going to get taxed on the deficit anyway. Yep. And if that's going to be the case, you might as well capture the revenue that you're missing out on. Exactly. And then you almost get a race for taxes to get a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. And that that's where you want to be is where you want to be. Um, and then the the kind of final thing I have here is moving toward a global asset registry. Mm -hmm. So there are a few things to that should happen here. One is the U.S. joining the CRS, which I mentioned before. FATCA is good, but isn't great. And it introduces unnecessary complexity to have the two different systems the u.s has held off for a while it should it should buckle it should give in join the crs it'll help this entire system because it's such a big player it's the mm -hmm. biggest player right um any this, type of global arrangement like this that doesn't include the u.s isn't really serious exactly exactly um the crs needs to extend 
to cover real estate mm. and other assets that it doesn't cover right now. The next frontier being cryptocurrency, which has seen its market cap explode from twenty billion to one trillion dollars since twenty seventeen. It's probably gone down since then, but that's all right. Yeah, yeah, you're right, <laughs> a little bit. Um, this came out pretty recently, though. Yeah, so. yeah, no, it did. Um, but generally, we just need as much information transparency as possible. We need to know where is offshore wealth managed? Where do the owners of that wealth live? Who are the owners? How is the wealth distributed, right? Is it at the top of the distribution or closer to the bottom? What is the income generated by that wealth? What are the taxes collected on that income for the different countries? All of this we need to be more publicly available more easy to access so that we can determine who owes taxes, how much do they owe, and what countries do they owe the taxes to. At the moment, certain studies can gather this information, but only from individual countries, which have to sign on to the study being done with the information that they get from CRS. It should be publicly available. Mm. Um, and then... So this data could be aggregated at a regional level and then up to a global level. And this would just be a crucial input in levying a minimum tax. We're just, we're just more behind than we should be as far as digitizing all of this information and congregating it into one database. This is almost, yeah, it's like the stuff is the technology of the stone age right now. Yes. And it's because the private sector is efficient at making money mm -hmm. and one of the very very best ways of making money is just not paying taxes yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a very very efficient way of doing it yeah um they don't have to spend a lot of money to get around this and they're always trying to be one step ahead in the technological race we need to catch up absolutely yeah this is this is just like we were just talking about with the irs this is just a fantastic investment mm -hmm. to be making right now absolutely right it's something where Yes, it, you are going to need more input up front or more investment up front, um, but the dividends are going to be enormous. Enormous. Yeah. All right, guys. You happy? I'm happy. I am too. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. See ya. Bye-bye.